Hey everyone, Michelle and Dr. Hashmi here with Plant-Based Kidney Health. And my question for you today, Dr. Hashmi, is what are SGL2 inhibitors? How can they help with kidney disease? Um, are there any potential downsides um, or harmful effects of them? Got it. Okay, so SGLT2s, this is a, another one of those videos that, guys, you really need to watch at least two, three times because there's going to be a lot of information. So feel free to skip around, look at the sections that you want to. But the first thing to note is SGLT2 stands for sodium glucose co-transporters. And so sodium glucose co-transporter inhibitors, they block exactly that. So there's a channel and the job of that channel is essentially to pull sugar that's leaving our bodies, right? And what it's trying to do is pull it back inside our bodies. So as we inhibit that, all we're going to do is prevent that sugar that's going through the kidneys and trying to get out. It's just going to end up peeing it out. Now, the class of drugs, these SGLT2 inhibitors, you can always recognize classes of drugs by how they end. So all of these drugs end as gliflozins, gliflozins. So for example, the, the common ones are canna gliflozin, dapa gliflozin, empa gliflozin, ER2 gliflozin. So remember, if it ends in a gliflozin, you know that's a SGLT2 inhibitor. So the main function, once again, is what? They're going to prevent glucose or sugar from being reabsorbed in their body. And where do they work? In the first part of the kidneys, which we call the proximal tubule going on. Now, the other benefits of this stuff is, so one is, you know, by preventing some of that sugar, you're losing some sugar, so it will have an impact on your sugars. The other couple of benefits that are interesting, and we'll talk about them, is one, they actually lower your blood pressure a little bit, and two, they can help out a little bit with weight loss going on, and we'll talk about those in a second. But the first thing you got to know is who are the people who should absolutely not take an SGLT2 inhibitor. Before we even talk about the functions and kidneys and all that fun stuff, you got to understand if you're a type 1 diabetic, we definitely do not want you to take it. Type 1s? No. If you've had something known as diabetic ketoacidosis or DKA, DKA is just a fancy term and essentially what it says is what happens in DKA is you just don't have enough insulin. So because you don't have enough insulin, you start to create all these ketones. Remember, ketones happen when you don't have sugar floating around, right? That's the breakdowns. And when you think about a ketogenic diet, we talk about ketones. But here you have so many ketones that they start to do all sorts of bad things. The other thing is, is if you are somebody who's had a lot of urine infections, so urinary tract infections, if you're getting a lot of them or yeast infections down there, you definitely do not want to take this. Now, one of the contraindications, which I have no idea because I just don't understand how SGLT2 inhibitors do this, but if you're somebody who already has low bone mineral density, we definitely don't want you to take SGLT2s. This is a discussion you would have with your nephrologist, with your endocrinologist going on to decide whether or not it's right for you. Okay, so now you know why not to take them. Let's talk about the benefits of why you should take them. So the first thing is, is when we look at sugars and A1C, remember we measure sugars with hemoglobin A1C. That is a way of doing a 90-day average because a red blood cell lasts for about 120 days. Sugar attaches to the red blood cell. So we're measuring how much sugar is attaching to the red blood cell. So on average, we see a hemoglobin A1C improvement of about half a percent to about one percent. So most medications can improve your A1C by about one percent. This is similar to that. It's not as strong as some of the other medications because the mechanism is just trying to let some of the sugar go through the urine. Now, one thing I'll tell you is, is nobody has any clue what happens if for years and years or even decades, you use a medicine like this where you're just having constant sugar go through your urine. That part we don't know. But what we do know is that the number of benefits that we are seeing with SGLT2 inhibitors are quite phenomenal. For example, there's wonderful studies, well-designed, longer-term studies that show when it comes to cardiovascular, meaning dying from any sort of heart issues going on, there are significant reductions 
in type 2 diabetics who are on SGLT2 inhibitors. When we look at heart failure patients who have diabetes going on, putting them on an SGLT2 reduces their risk of hospitalization, improves their symptoms of heart failure going on. But the thing that all of you guys want to know is what about kidneys? Well, the latest data shows that when it comes to kidneys getting worse, whether or not you're a diabetic, it doesn't matter. If we give you an SGLT2, it will reduce the risk. In fact, Every single one of my kidney patients, unless they have a contraindication, if they're spilling protein in the urine, I put them on an SGLT2. Now, you have to make sure their kidney is good enough because if their GFR is very low, then you can. In general, for example, I use empagliflozin, and that's just because that's the one that we are able to get the best deal for our members going on. But with empagliflozin, we don't use them in patients whose GFR is less than 20. Officially, if they're less than 30, that's what it says is you shouldn't be using them. We go all the way down to 20 going on. Now, when you look at things like all-cause mortality in kidney disease patients, what's fascinating is you can lower this by about 14% simply by putting patients on SGLT2. Now, that being the case, and, and there's a lot of discussion that SGLT2s should really be considered as first-line agents in diabetes in lieu of metformin. You know, that's still to be decided because metformin in many ways is safer, but it is doesn't have that same sort of benefits to your heart, to all of these other things going on as SGLT2s do. But SGLT2s have some serious side effects you want to know about, and we've touched upon them, but let's kind of dive in a little bit more. So first is infection. The risk of urinary tract infections and the risk of candidal or yeast infections down there does go up significantly. In some studies, it's about 10% of the pop, um, study participants end up getting it. SGLT2 inhibitors, they act as mild diuretics. And so what happens is when you're on them, you're going to pee a lot. And remember, you, you often see this in diabetics when they don't know they're diabetic yet and their sugars are high, they end up peeing a lot. This is similar. You're throwing sugar through the urine and it's going to take water with it. So you will pee more. And that's actually beneficial in heart failure patients because we want to get rid of extra water. But you can also have lower blood pressures. Remember, we said you can have low blood pressure as a benefit. Well, that benefit, if it's too much, it could be too low blood pressure, you could get hypotension. Because of the fact that these things are causing you to have volume leaving your body, there is a chance for acute kidney injury. That's why when we start somebody on an SGLT2, we always check their electrolytes and their creatinine to make sure they're okay. There's also a chance for DKA or diabetic ketoacidosis, which we explained a minute or so ago. And then Something that's very, very rare, but you still want to be aware, is there is this small increase in a risk of amputations. And part of that is, is, is it because they're more likely to get certain types of infections that don't heal well? We don't really know, but there is a possibility and you want to know about. It. And then, of course, any time you're trying to make somebody pee out sugar, it's taking water, you're going to get dehydrated, you're going to feel more thirsty going on, so you're going to want to drink. So putting this all together, what's the bottom line here? SGLT2s have benefits that can be found for your sugars in terms of improvements by up to one point or one percentage point in your A1C, which is substantial. They're good for preventing cardiovascular mortality. They're good for heart failure patients. And for us, most importantly, the data is very solid, showing that they can lower the risk of kidney function decline. I have a question or two, if that's okay, on this, because um, I've been asked this before. So why would these medications can't, if it, the GFR is lower than 20 or 30, why is it not recommended? Is it because of that risk of acute kidney injury or because it's not studied in this, you know, with the low GFR or what is it? Yeah. So for example, in empagliflozin, and where we started initial data was, it wasn't really studied in people with GFRs less than 30. Now we have more data coming out and studies where they've taken it down to GFRs of 20. And that's why in my own clinical practice, I'll actually take them down to 20 because the benefit is there. The other thing to note is all of the studies show this is the best benefit of SGLT2s 
is not if you wait until your CKD4 or mm -hmm. five or whatever. The best benefit is if you start somebody early. So this is where it becomes so important for everybody who's listening and watching is, is if you guys have chronic kidney disease, you got to talk to your doctor. Chronic kidney disease has no symptoms. And this is why by the time most patients come to us, there's so little that we can actually do. And we have to have awareness. But with SGLT2s, as wonderful as they are, you have to start early. And if you wait, the side effects, such as DKA, such as infections, they all increase. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Well, there you guys have it. Um, I hope hopefully that addressed everyone's question on that medication. And um, you can leave further questions in the comments and we'll see you guys next time. Thanks. Thanks, guys.